Hey, Kevin here, Skylabs, bringing you another video. Definitely gonna be a fun one. I think we're gonna make a series out of this. Uh, this will be a buyer beware series for newer people coming into the hobby that I think could really benefit from some information from you and other veterans of the vintage audio world. There are a lot of problematic issues with either manufacturers or specific pieces of equipment. And I think we'll highlight a couple of those every episode of the series. It should be hopefully really informative without bashing on anything. That is my intention. I get no gratification from saying something is of poor quality. It's just a poor quality. That's all it is. And we're gonna do another top five turntable list because we've gotten a lot of feedback about the last one. And everybody would like an auto return list and everybody would like a manual list. So let's do the auto return one first, meaning at the end of the record, the tone arm either lifts up and stops or at the end of the record, the tone arm lifts up and returns. Put your favorite model, favorite make down in the description. In a few weeks, we'll tally them all up. We'll make the list and we'll put out that video. Hope to get a lot of submissions just to add validity to the results. So. Uh, appreciate it. Head down to the comments and leave your make and model. And the first one on our buyer beware list is MCS. And I don't think MCS is a huge shocker to a lot of people out there. Uh, MCS was a store brand for JC Penney's. I think some of the models even said JC Penney on the faceplate. And like Realistic and some of the other manufacturers, these weren't made by MCS. There's a lot of speculation as to who made the turntables, who made the cassette decks, who made the receivers, that type of thing. But the majority kind of agree that it was Panasonic Techniques, NEC, and a company called Foster, which evidently became Fostex. This is just what I saw online, so don't take any of that as truth. And I'll definitely say, as far as the MCS brand goes, uh, their turntables are not that bad. The receivers are a different ball game. And with the receivers, over the years, we've had the gamut of them, uh, small entry level, midline, and you know the big, uh, more monster type receivers. I think some of them are better than others, but too many times we've had really poor service literature with no voltages. I'm not gonna mix words. In my opinion, the motto should have been get us these specs for as cheap as you can and try and make it last through the warranty. And I know that's gonna upset some people out there because I have a few customers that come in that really do like MCS. And these units don't sound that bad, I'm not saying that. From a tech's perspective with the lack of literature and the really poor components, they're just not very serviceable. And that, that's just the bottom line. There's a reason why they are so much cheaper than everything else. If you compare watt to watt with almost anything out there, the MCS will be a quarter of the price of what a more premium brand would be. And it's because of the quality of the components they used. And for those of us that have been in this hobby for long enough, just looking at a couple photos of these, you can see some red flags going off. MCS definitely wasn't scared of using bells and whistles to draw you into their products. A lot of graphic EQs, a lot of elaborate graphics, maybe showing you more scientific type of things just to make it look more sophisticated than it was. But really, it's hard to get past the look of the cheap knobs and the little red LED indicators. It doesn't take much to realize that, that these were very, very economically built they had an economical price point they did sound really good for their price i'm not disputing that but as far as something that's serviceable or worthy of putting a decent repair into personally i would just put my money someplace else um, get yourself an entry level yamaha pioneer sansui uh, what have you just be careful when buying mcs equipment you might have trouble finding somebody to fix it most likely the repair would be more expensive than finding another one that's already working. It's just the way it is. So if you love MCS, I'm sorry. Um, and the next one I wanted to talk about, I kind of picked this one off my list because I really love 
the Sansui 9090 DB, it would be easier for me to come off as not bashing it because I really, really like these receivers. Um, this is a flagship receiver from one of my favorite brands. They have one of my favorite looks to them. This is 115 watts per, or maybe it's 130. It might be 130 watts per channel. It's one of the two, either 115 or 130. Anyway, the 9090 DB does have a really big issue. And this is specific to the Sansui 9090 DB, the 8080 DB, and the European counterparts, the 890 or the 990 DB for Sansui. I've had people ask me before, they'll say, I've got a Marantz with a Dolby board in it, or I've got the Sansui G9000 Dolby. And, you know, am I going to have an issue with it? And no, this is specific to uh, these two models. So, and it is something you just need to know about because not a lot of people will work on these, even though you might read online that, oh, it's simple, you can bypass it. It's really not that hard. Why the process of bypassing it is really not that difficult, it is extremely time consuming. And paying a technician their hourly rate to do this long, tedious process, um, it, it's really gonna get expensive and it's really gonna slow down the workflow. So um, for that reason, as of now, um, we're gonna continue not to service, not to purchase, and not to sell the 9090 dBs or 8080 dBs. And with the Dolby board, the reason this becomes such an issue is I think it was mainly for um, recording to tape. If you were recording FM or your record player or what have you, you could put the Dolby noise reduction on your source before sending it uh, to be recorded. And when this Dolby board fails, what it does is it, it cuts off your inputs and doesn't allow them to send that audio source to the amplifier. So it has to be fixed or bypassed. You have two choices. Now with the Dolby board, there's also two variants. You have the early version, which is a green ribbon cabled Dolby board. And you have the later version, which is black. And the black ribbon cable is supposed to be better. It's thicker. It has less tendencies to crack and cause failures like the green one does. So outside of the Dolby board issue, there is a possibility that even the ribbon cable used to attach the Dolby board to the other boards uh, could fail as well. So if you have a choice of purchasing two 9090 dBs and one has a green and one has a black one, take the black one. That might save you another issue. Just want to bring this up, even though to a lot of people that have been in the, the vintage audio world a long time are very well aware of this issue, we do have people quite often that are 9090 dB owners that hear about it for the first time when they call us or they come in. You might never have an issue with your Dolby board, but if you do, you're going to be kind of limited on who repairs it and how much it's going to cost and if it's even repairable at all, or maybe it might have to be bypassed. Just doing a quick Google search on 9090 dB, you'll, you'll get a lot of information on a lot of people's struggles to get these repaired. We are not unique um, in not working on the Sansui Dolby boards, so. And the next one on the list is gonna be quadraphonic receivers. And we see this one quite a bit. People will come in with a quadraphonic receiver. They don't even know what quadraphonic is. They saw a massive silver face receiver and they just bought it because they got a good deal on it. And without doing a huge deep dive into quadraphonic because there's tons of information out there on that, it essentially was a way to get more of a atmospheric sound using four amplifiers, four speakers, a turntable specifically set up for quadraphonic playback or a reel-to-reel -reel setup for quadraphonic playback. And unfortunately, quadraphonic just didn't grow legs. I think it was looked at as really expensive. There wasn't a lot of source material out there. I think he had two or three codecs, so two different versions of quadraphonic, depending on what brand it was. So there was a little bit of homework involved, making sure that the quadraphonic record would work with your cartridge, and if that cartridge would work with the specific receiver you had. So it was kind of complicated. There wasn't a true winner like there was with like beta and VHS, 
And really in a lot of ways, it was kind of the precursor to 5.1 surround. There's something about having two ears and two speakers that feels right. I think to most people when they listen to music. And I think a lot of that is because, you know, with a two channel system, really what you're trying to replicate, or at least what most people are trying to replicate is a live performance. And anytime you go to a live performance or anytime I do, there's a band in front of me and they're playing their instruments. And the music is, for the most part is coming from where I see it. With quadraphonic having you know, keyboards and guitars coming from behind you, there's not really much natural about it. And while some music definitely could lend itself to that, I think most people just prefer two channel stereo. Not to say that there aren't people out there that really enjoy quadraphonic or uh, multi-channel audio. And so the next thing you might say is, well, what's wrong with the quadraphonic receivers? And really that comes down to, you've got four amplifiers inside of one receiver as opposed to two. So there's four amplifiers to service if there is an issue. And then the switching matrix of one of these to send audio to different paths really adds another layer of complexity to the receiver itself. And for that reason, a lot of times, a quadraphonic repair will take more time. Therefore, it will cost more money to fix. And because today quadraphonic still is not as popular as they wanted it to be, as in, in order to get what this receiver was intended to do, you need a quadraphonic turntable, a quadraphonic source, and four speakers at a minimum to use that receiver the way it was intended. And so if you are out there shopping for a vintage stereo receiver from the 70s and you see a really massive uh, vintage stereo and you're like, why is that so cheap? That thing is a monster. It's gotta have a ton of power. Verify it's not quadraphonic because a lot of times you end up getting a really low wattage receiver uh, in, a, in the same cabinet housing that would house you know, a monster receiver it's just that it's got four low watt amplifiers in it and you're not really going to be able to get the benefit of all four unless you're going to run four speakers and most people don't so quadraphonic just know what you're getting into before you get into it that's all and the next buyer beware on the list we've got banging olufsen don't shoot me and first off i gotta start off by saying by no means am i saying Bang & Olufsen is poor quality or they sound bad. These are very well-built pieces of equipment. They are just extremely unique in their build design and their build philosophy across the board. And in all reality, I'm actually a really big fan of their speakers. I think some of the Bang & Olufsen speakers from the 70s sound incredible. We sell quite a few of them because they audition really well. A lot of times if I have Bang & Olufsen's on the wall of speakers and we're sitting there a being them, almost without question, even if they don't buy the Bang & Olufsen's, their eyes get big and they go, okay, that's something to consider. Definitely not knocking b and speakers. I'm not knocking their turntables or receivers either. There's just a few things you might wanna know before you purchase one. And really with Bang & Olufsen, I really cannot emphasize this enough, how unique they are and how different they are in their design, in everything Bang & Olufsen. I actually laughed the other day and showed the guys at the shop because I was putting away all those service documents and I was putting them all into a filing cabinet and there's probably uh, 40 manufacturers and they all fit in this nice two compartment filing cabinet. And then I went to put the Bang & Olufsen paperwork and the dealership handouts into the filing cabinet and what do you know they don't fit. Of all the manufacturers that we have literature for, and they all fit in the same spot, the Bang & Olufsen documents don't fit. Of course they don't, because nothing they do fits anything other than Bang & Olufsen. And if you live in the Bang & Olufsen ecosystem, everything is great, everything is easy. That's the way they sold it. They wanted the setup of their system to be very user-friendly. A lot of proprietary cables, a lot of proprietary jacks. And while this makes setup of this equipment very easy, as long as you stay in their ecosystem, once you get out of their ecosystem or once you try bringing in another manufacturer's piece of equipment, 
you realize you're now in adapter land and you're going to be trying to convert banging Olson connectors to what the rest of the world uses, which is RCA and bare speaker wire. So while you have to appreciate the design of Bang & Olsen, the simplicity of it, there are a lot of limitations because of it too. So why doesn't Skylabs work on Bang & Olsen amplifiers and turntables? And it's the same reason a lot of other people don't. Because it's so unique, you need to learn its own characteristics and what it needs, and it, it becomes more of a specialty service. It's kind of like a Volkswagen bus. There's a huge Volkswagen bus or Beatles community out there. And those Volkswagen mechanics, a lot of times you see, they really only work on those. That's their thing. And they're really good at them. You can't just take a Volkswagen bus or an old Beetle to any mechanic. Um, they're gonna say the same thing. I don't know anything about those, even though it's the same universe, they're kind of in their own little world. And it's the same way for Bang & Olsen. To me, because of that sleek design, which is a very, I mean, their, their design is incredible. Bang & Olsen is a piece of art. However, it reminds me of working on a laptop. Because their pieces are so thin, they had to utilize every single centimeter in there. It's not that you can't repair this stuff. It's just, it'd be better to take it to a specialist that knows these things inside and out because it's kind of their own universe. That's not a bad thing. It's just a specific thing. It's not to say you shouldn't get into B&O equipment. It's just, you might want to be aware that you might have to look a little bit harder to find somebody to work on it, just like you would with a Volkswagen bus. I don't hate Bang & Olsen. It's just not right for us to service it. It's right for somebody else. That's all. Hope you enjoyed the video. Hopefully you will leave in your comments, maybe equipment that you've taken to a technician that they weren't able to fix, or you've tried multiple places and multiple places turned you down. Because if somebody goes and checks the comments section and it keeps them from buying, you know, a lemon or something, they're gonna struggle with repairing. I think that's a really good thing, especially to the newbies of the hobby. Uh, we we're all newbies at one point, just drunk on silver face receivers. Uh, I've still got a hangover from it. It's a great hobby, really good community. Besides the pronunciation police that have seemed to pick up in the comment section, and maybe it's because I trolled them a little bit with that techniques thing, but wow, wow. So anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. really hope I didn't offend anybody. That's the last thing I wanna do. Go check out skylabsaudio.com forward slash shop if you'd like to grab a cool t-shirt or something like that. And we'll see you in the next video. Definitely appreciate it.